This large gathering is a reunion of family descended from Kuang Su Duck, a bold and generous Chinese gentleman who left his home to seek a better life in a new and strange land. Descendants recall his story and now celebrate together with a curious mix of culture and traditions of both Western and Chinese origin. But above all, these people are celebrating with a sense of unity, which comes when one knows they belong to a family. Kuang Su Duck, the herbalist, respected and remembered in Darwin, Cairns, Townsville and Melbourne, was described as unique in Australian immigration history. His family of four wives and 24 children received acceptance at a time when Europeans in Australia were generally uneasy with the influx of the Chinese, whom they called Celestials. To those of us today discovering our own cultural heritage, his life was unusual and remarkable in many ways. Adventurous, but always mindful of his origins and his paternal responsibilities, Kuang Su Duck worked hard to raise a very large family in an entirely foreign land. He influenced those around him with a culture and approach to life which was steeped in simple values. Harmony and virtue in the self, in the family and in the land were important to this man and such ideas still find expression in those who remember him. More than 1,000 years ago, in the year 960, the family name of Kuang was bestowed upon High Minister Gong Luk of Anhui Province, China, by the first emperor of the Song Dynasty. He was sent south on a punitive expedition to help unify China's south with the north. Five generations later, in Guangdong, southern China, Kuang Sam Chut began to record this family tree. Kuang Yu Ping was military commander for the Southern Song Emperor, and his son, Yat Seng, was teacher to the prince in the 13th century, the time of the Magna Carta and of Genghis Khan. Through the rich Tang and Ming dynasties, the Kuangs were by tradition imperial scholars and government officials. The 22nd generation of the Kuang family began in the 18th century, the middle of the Qing dynasty, when Western traders and missionaries were entering China. In 1848, the discovery of gold in California brought people from all corners of the world to seek their fortune. There was social and political unrest through China, and many Chinese were leaving the crowded southern provinces to join the gold rushes. It was against this background that in September 1853, great-grandfather Kuang Su Duck was born in the village of Toisan in Guangdong province, China. He was the youngest of three sons and a 26th generation Kuang. Wai Yao sent Kuang Su Duck, the youngest of his three sons, to start a new life and seek his fortune in America. The California gold fields were known by the Chinese as Gum San or Gold Mountain. It is not known what work Kuang Su Duck found, but he was still a youth when he returned to China to pay respects to father and repay his debt to the family. 
continued schooling and began studies of traditional herbal medicine. And in 1874, Kwang Su Duck's marriage to Jia Gao was arranged by his parents. Following the birth of his first child, Gong Sing, in 1875, Kwong sailed from Canton to Sun Gum San, or New Gold Mountain, in Australia, in search of new riches and opportunities. In 1875, on the Palmer River gold fields, the Asiatic population swelled to about 18,000, outnumbering by three times the local European population. Records do not tell us what Kwong did in the first years in Australia, or how he established his wealth, but we know he began to develop a liking for this harsh yet promising land. Following a brief visit to his family in China, Kwong returned to Australia, this time to the Northern Territory gold fields. The economies on these rugged fields boomed and Kwong soon established one of the most successful general trade stores in Southport, Gateway Township to the gold fields. He became well known by his business name of Sun Mao Lung with a staggering £25,000 annual turnover in trade. Prospering early in the Northern Territory, Kwong soon married a second wife, Chan Ngo Gui, and then a third, Yun Yuk Lao, both of whom were brought out to Australia by his friends or relatives. He then began businesses in Palmerston, now the northern capital called Darwin, and this time he bought a number of rental properties, again under the business name Sun Mao Lung. One of his projects was an experiment in processing opium for which he constructed a large stone building in Kavanagh Street. Now known as the Stone Houses, this is the only building which remains from the original Darwin Chinatown. The opium experiment was unsuccessful and Kwong sold his share of the building a few years later. On gold fields around Australia, the populous Chinese were not always welcome and were often perceived as a threat. The Europeans often referred to the Chinese as celestials, an unusual race of people who appeared to be from another world entirely. Some persons unknown had driven about 18 horses belonging to Chinese teamsters some miles down the Flinus from the crossing and there killed them. Tensions ran high at times. As showing the feeling of the Chinese at Southport towards Europeans since the late horse killing raid, they're showing their disapproval of the ghastly act by keeping among themselves the few pounds that would otherwise have fallen into the European storekeeper's hands. A poll tax of £10 per head will be imposed, subject to parliamentary sanction, on all Chinese arriving in the Northern Territory. J. Langdon Parsons, government resident. The landing tax was imposed on all arrivals of Chinese and helped to slow Chinese entry to Australia. Chinese, nevertheless, did receive some tolerance and acceptance. Throughout remote northern centres, the Chinese contributed significantly to local communities and to the development of the region. Chinese leaders in the Northern Territory would regularly entertain the government resident and visiting dignitaries. Kwong Sui Duck, known by his business name Sun Mao Lung, was once nominated to take up the position of government resident 
although the possibility was given little Stand further paper, debate. Some valued correspondent up country supplies a suggestion that the billet should be offered to Sun Mao Lung at Southport. It will be a tight question which is the most fitted for the position, Mr. Sun Mao Lung or Mr. T.K. Pater. For our part, we think the former would get the most votes if the question was submitted to the ballot box. Great-grandfather made repeated visits to his family in China. Following a trip in 1889, the 36-year-old Kwong brought his first wife and children out to Palmerston to join his other two wives and family. And in the next 12-year period, altogether 12 children were born. Thomas, Samgui, Edward, Leslie, Elsie, Fred, Lim, Maisie, William, Kathleen, May and Lily. It was apparent that this family of Celestials were setting their roots firmly in the new country. Kwong also fostered other children from China and arranged passage for many others to make a new start in the country they called New Gold Mountain. Into the 1890s, Kwong Su Duck prospered with his store, rental properties and herbal medicine. Under his business name of Sun Mao Lung, he purchased at least five large gold mining leases in the territory. But production from these fields would begin to decline and much of the region faced a downturn. In January of 1897, a tropical cyclone delivered a shocking blow to Palmerston and a big setback to the Sun Mao Lung business. Kwong lost many of his rental properties and the family also had one extra mouth to feed. Lim, the cyclone child, was born on the day of the storm. Another Chinese woman, wife of Sun Mao Lung, after being safely removed from the fallen buildings, presented her lord and master with a baby boy. And both are doing well. In 1898, Kwong Su Duck returned to China with first wife Ji Xi and her four children. In Canton, Kwong was married to his fourth wife, Wang Gui Fa, who had come from Peking to visit her former mistress. Leaving first wife and her children in China, Kwong returned with his new wife to Palmerston. At the time of Federation, the economy of the Northern Territory struggled. The production from the gold fields slowed and Kwong's enterprises suffered. A court appearance on a charge of selling alcohol illegally must have been a harrowing experience in this difficult time. In support of this statement, we might first of all point out that Sun Mao Long is one of the most respected Chinese merchants in the territory and has earned the character of a thoroughly straightforward and honest man. The court proved him innocent, but to support his growing family, Kwong still had to search elsewhere for brighter opportunities. In 1902, Kwong Suduk finally obtained the necessary permits to enter Queensland and took a ship to the northeastern port of Cairns. A man in Cairns, who still owed £3,500 to Kwong, gave him a two-storey building to live in rent-free. He then gave additional money so that Kwong could send for his family, and in due time, wives two, three and four and all the children arrived in Cairns by ship. This was just in time for the birth of Gong Sun, or Harry, in January 1903, and proud father was quick to make known his arrival. Number four wife, get him a boy, half past three, yesterday. Now, in his 50th year, he set up shop in Sack Street, Chinatown, next door to the Sea Up Chinese Temple. And from there, he dispensed medicinal herbs and sold Chinese provisions. In Cairns, great-grandfather would ensure that his children had the opportunity to receive a good education. The children were immediately enrolled at the Cairns State School, but reception from the European community in Cairns was at first met with some reservation. The secretary was instructed to write to the Department of Public Instruction with reference to the Chinese attending the school 
and point out that several of the parents had made complaints on the matter and requesting the department to devise some means for their education apart from the state school. In lively crowded Chinatown, the Europeans saw strange temples and customs. They saw gambling, brothels and the use of opium. I do not say I do not hold with the Chows in the country at all. They can come in our country and bring out two or three wives and nothing is said. I believe they live in a small pokey den with either 18 or 14 children, which cannot be healthy. I hope something will be done as we want a white Australia. In this atmosphere of antagonism, Kwong still progressed well in Cairns, adopting the Australian laws and system as best he could. He acted as consul for his countrymen, sorting out any difficulties they might have with the local authorities. Hong Sui Duck made himself available to everybody and became one of Chinatown's most influential citizens. Whilst in Cairns, four more children, Annie, Maud, Victor and number 10 son, Gong Won, were born to third and fourth wives. Gong Won died very early, and this was why Su Duck adopted the young Lawrence and Violet. Violet and Lawrence, why did they adopt them? Because, uh, I told you, one of my brothers died. Uh -huh. so my father know. dreamt every night, you know, the son that died, come to ask him to get somebody, to adopt somebody to replace. So that's where my father adopted them. They are brother and sister, two of them. Ida, the youngest of 24 children, was born in Hong Kong after the whole family left Cairns en masse to find Chinese wives for the eldest boys. By the steamer Tsinan on Tuesday, Dr. Kwong Su Duck, accompanied by his three wives and a number of his family, left on a visit to China, the party numbering 13. Passengers were at first inclined to think that Cairns was losing its famous Chinatown. However, Kwong Sui Duck's roots were firmly established in Australia, and in 1910 he returned to the northern port city of Townsville, near the gold mining centre of Charters Towers. With the family following from Canton, he quickly established another general store and Chinese herbal medicine practice. People in the region knew him as Dr. Kwong. You see, and he was a doctor. They call him a quack doctor. <laughs> <laughs> a quack doctor? Yeah. But a lot of people like him, you know, call him. And he only used, I know what he used, plain, very plain medicine. Mm -hmm. And they call him a quack, we call him a quack doctor. The way that he was allowed to be named doctor uh, is the first Chinese herbalist to be called doctor, which normally they, it's not allowed to be referred to themselves as doctor. So he's really happy and proud to think he was uh, able to be named doctor. I don't see much of that. He goes out early in the morning to deliver his herbs to his different patients and uh, then about six o'clock he'll come home for his tea. Despite a busy life and high community profile, Kwong was always responsible for his wives and children. You know, my father was very smart. When he had the first one, when he had the first one had children, he took the second, oh, I'm going to get a second one to help you take care of children. <laughs> when he get the third one, I help you, I'm getting the third one to help you take care of the children. Uh, sorry. Did you all live, uh, did you all live together? Where did uh, you all live? Not with the first mother. Number two, number three, number four been living together for a while. Uh -huh. Then afterward, number two stay with her children. Number four and mother two live together most of the time. Like many pioneer women, Kwong's wives were industrious and strove to create a mostly harmonious family life. In Townsville, 
second mother, third mother and fourth mother, all in the one house with a few of us children. And second mother, she control us, see that we behave and not be wild and unruly. And another thing, she's a very good midwife and a very good cook. And at times she will help my mother to do the cooking. And we all live in harmony and we all know what to expect of us. Third mother, she would do sewing and friends would bring some of their sewing over for third mother to repair for them and she's really good needle worker and then at night we would sit around her when she finished sewing and she would tell us stories from the opera Chinese opera and at times she will sing opera song to us. What about number four, your own mother? Did um, she have duties around the house too? Yes, she had her duties to perform. She had to see to the house is all tidy and she does the cooking and the laundry and uh, prepare all the meals and that's all she has to do. That's her duty. You know, we did a lot of work. A lot of work? <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a big uh, net oh, yeah. for fishing. For fishing yeah. We need those, my mother very good. We need fishing net. Morty, me, and my mother. We work very fast. Big fish net. The family stayed in Townsville until 1917. Then, at the age of 64, Kwong moved his family to Chinatown, Melbourne, where he hoped to find suitable husbands for his youngest daughters. When we came down to Melbourne, we, the Tsinghua Society found us a hall to stay in, to sleep in until he found a, a shop to continue his herbless. And then we went, was moved to friends help him to find a shop in Russell Street in the city and then he found that was too small for all of us. He moved a few doors further up with the three-store building and the first floor was for the herbalists. In addition to his herbal medicine practice, which now took him regularly to distant parts of Victoria, Dr Kwong would bank and lend money for people in the busy port. Oh, there's a long story to it. He has a lot of, he buy a lot of gold from the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. When they buy their sovereign, and uh, the Chinese people, all the shipmen, they come in, they buy it from my dad. Yeah, they yeah. buy all gold back to China. And one day, uh, four boys come in. They say, should I, you have sovereign? You have gold? Then my father said, yes. So when my dad showed the boy the sovereign, one of them knocked his head and the other robbed all the money. Oh, no. And they ran through the front door instead of the back door. Oh. So my father keep on chasing, chasing. I think he has a little blood running. And then they took my father in the police station and they called me up. They called me up and my brother and asked me what happened. I said, they robbed my dad. Youngest child, Ida, remembers those times in the Kwong household, how the patriarch would dispatch his discipline. Well, if we were too unruly, all he'd do and make a funny little noise, go, <coughs> that means, behave. No noise, no playing around. On another occasion, Ida recalls an enjoyable tradition. His birthday and Chinese New Year. Uh, on his birthday, you have to hand him a cup of tea and bow three times before you give it to him. And he will take the cup of tea and drink it first. And then he will hand you the uh, lacy, which is a red packet with money in it. And on New Year's Day, it's the same. He will sit in his favourite chair and wait for to bring the cup of tea to him, bow three times, 
can in with two hands, always two hands, and give him the cup of tea. He'll do the same thing, drink it first, and then he will give you a lacy with a lucky red packet with money in it again, which we all look forward on those two occasions. In later years, Dr Kwong travelled again from Melbourne to Hong Kong, Shanghai and Canton to Cairns and Townsville, visiting his widespread family of children and grandchildren. He remained in good health always. Then, while visiting his children in northern Queensland, great-grandfather passed away from a short illness at age 76. And thus, a remarkable chapter in the Kwong family story ended in Townsville on the 17th of February, 1929. Even well after this period, social recognition may not have come easily for Australia's non-naturalised migrant families. For the Chinese, however, this appeared to worry them little. They just worked hard, lived frugally, looking for the peaceful and harmonious way through such obstacles. Kwong's children were still required to hold identity cards, and this applied even to those who were born in Australia. These were times of economic hardship for all, but the struggles and perseverance of Australia's migrant population continued to forge a new and wonderfully diverse community of people, stubborn and productive. Kwong Suduk's chosen career of herbal medicine was particularly unusual and he was well remembered wherever he went. At the time of his death, Dr Kwong was survived by four wives, 23 of his 24 children and a growing legacy of grand and great-grandchildren who returned his bones for burial in China according to custom. The wives of Kwong now lived with their children where the family history and cultural heritage would continue to be passed on. In their later years, third wife became a devout Buddhist. Second and fourth wives were to choose Christianity. The next generation of Kwongs remained close despite the diversity of paths and the distances which separated them. They had letters and newsletters and a degree of mobility to which they were now accustomed. Thomas was the eldest son in Australia and remained in northern Queensland operating general stores. Gambling houses were common at the time and he had several successful businesses in Innisfail, Ingham and Townsville. Thomas and second brother Edward worked closely together in businesses in North Queensland. Edward later moved with his wife Eva to Melbourne. With Edward, he was the second son and uh, with so many in the family, um, he was the one that Kwong Su Duk looked towards to help him uh, as regards schooling for the children and the younger sons, really. He was responsible for whatever happened outside the home. If they were in trouble in the city or township, wherever they are, were, um, my father used to have to answer. Leslie, or Gong Tong, also did well in the Babinda and Cairns area, then moved with his family to Sydney and later Melbourne, where he became a well-known director and performer in Chinese music charity concerts. Wong Gong Hoi, or Fred, eventually settled in Hong Kong, where he achieved success in mining stocks and shares. Fred had a large family, most of whom were to settle in America. His sister Annie recalls it was a big family. We call, everybody called him the cigar man. He just walk around do nothing. I don't know how he support his family. Fifteen children. And he just walked around. And he carry all the cigar. He go to the biggest restaurant, English, and uh, give everyone a cigar. In Hong Kong they call him the cigar man. <laughs> Gong Lum, or Lim, the cyclone child, appeared academically outstanding at a young age and was sent to private school in Hong Kong. 
He attended Lorry School in Shanghai with William and matriculated at Hangchow Presbyterian College. After graduating from Harvard and Columbia Universities, Lim joined the diplomatic service of the Republic of China and served as Consul General, firstly to the Philippines and then to San Francisco. He later became the president of the Bank of Canton in San Francisco and built it into a large and reputable institution there. Uncle Lim's wife, Hattie, recounted. He got along with so many people. He was a good president. People came to him at the bank and he was uh, able to uh, lend money to Chinese families that couldn't buy homes before. William also matriculated at private school in Shanghai. He and his young family fled the Japanese raids on Shanghai in 1944 and he later began teaching in Hong Kong. He became an accountant until retirement and then joined the Hang Seng Bank as an advisor and interpreter. Gong Sun, known as Harry, studied at Scotch College in Melbourne. He later operated restaurants in Melbourne with elder brother Edward, then continued with small businesses. Young Victor followed his brother Lim to private schools and Harvard University. He worked for the Chinese Embassy in Washington DC and at the inaugural United Nations conferences in San Francisco and Europe. Later with the United Nations and as an academic, Victor with his wife Nubo travelled the world and was able to record the family history. He would uh, gather information, uh, jot down information about the families and each, each family and, and their, num their birth dates and the number of children and all that and uh, everywhere he went and even uh, uh, not only in Australia but everywhere to, to in uh, England and in uh, Hong Kong and parts of China and Malaysia, he would, uh, uh, and even Fiji Island one time when we were there, he found some uh, relatives. Um, one of the most admirable qualities about Kwong Sudak, I thought, was that he tried to see that all of his daughters became first wives and not second or third or fourth wives because the first wife was generally treated as a queen and she was cared for by the other wives and I thought it was quite good that he found that uh, his daughters were going to be wives who were treated with respect. Of Kwong's Australian-born daughters, Lai Kin, the eldest, was the first to marry at 16 years. Arranged marriages were still the only choice for Kwong's eldest daughters, and Elsie's wedding in 1907 to Mr Lee Ji in Cairns was very traditional. Some of the younger daughters, nevertheless, discovered their husbands in different <laughs> we, ways. We, you know, we always sit at the kitchen, the back, you see, and people can come by. When people come by, they, they come in. Like, oh, one of them was, one man come all the time after my sister, after, after sister. May, you know, want to marry May. Really? Eventually, he got married to May. <laughs> As wives, mothers and individuals, the Kwong girls contributed to the success of their own families and businesses. Lai Kin operated her mixed business until she died at the age of 93. Maisie also raised a large family and helped to manage her family's business. Today, five generations later, the family is spread around the world. They have made successful lives in the societies and cultures of their adopted countries. In Australia, some Chinese characteristics and customs prevailed, but the new generations of Kwong saw themselves as essentially Australian. Marriage to non-Chinese would be inevitable. When third generation Bernie Lee Long married Pat Murdoch in the 1950s, they both detected mixed reactions from the people around them. In those days, uh, if you were Chinese in Innisfail, there weren't too many Chinese that, who weren't related to you, so if you wanted a partner, you had to look elsewhere. 
<laughs> but uh, w no, uh, we just started going, seeing each other, playing sport together, and at the dances. Um, then, when things looked as though they were getting a bit serious, um, my family were a little aghast at the association. But uh, after, well, we eventually married, and uh, after um, within a year or two years any animosity or whatever had disappeared. Daughter Tony of the fourth generation in Australia observes other changes in her family. A, a lot of the, the Asian features are not as dominant and um, they really blend quite readily with the rest of the community. Like many of her generation, Tony is proud of her ancestry. I think like an Australian, but I like to think that I'm Chinese. Spouses who find easy acceptance want only to become family. Paul Campbell married Jenny, great-granddaughter of Kwong Su Duck, and is now heavily committed himself to Kwong family research. But I can see a, very much a growth within all of the immediate family following the, the reunions. Where at the first Melbourne one, it was just great for people to see each other, to work out who they were, the relations. As the years have gone on, there's really been quite a, a move forward to um, an appreciation of the sense of history. Now, I didn't pick up that sense of history in the first reunion. It was, it was joyfulness and um, great joy, but placing themselves into um, the history of Australia has something that's grown since then, and I think that's very important. <laughs> Suduk's descendants now number around 780 and include five generations. Uncle Victor's wife Nubo provided us with the motivation to plan for the first Kwong family reunion, but even she couldn't imagine the lasting impact that such gatherings would have. It, Victor, all his years, uh, been very interested in the family, and uh, whenever he came over, over to, well, wherever he travelled, he would, if, if he knew that there was a Kwong member, he would look them up and get all the data on their family, the, the number of children and all that, and he would have this in notebooks and pieces of paper. He came over to Australia several times, and uh, so when he died in 1979, all that material was just uh, in no particular order, all, all mixed up, and I, I looked at it and I thought, oh my goodness, what, what to do with it? And I didn't feel that I should throw it or just leave it at where it was, so I decided that I would try to work out something, but I didn't know the names of, or connection of all this paper that I saw. So I made one special trip over to Australia to interview the, uh, all the family. So I traveled from uh, Melbourne all the way up to Cairns up here to, to gather material for it, to straighten and, and, and also to set up the information by families. If Uncle Victor was alive today, I don't think anything could delight him more in his life. I would say he would think this is the most successful venture he could ever possibly take in his life. He is that sort of guy that, that um, the family and history were very important in his, in his life. The reunion in Cairns was a new experience for Fiona and Louise Wong, great great granddaughters of Kwong Su Duck. Um, they took a bit of convincing to come up to this reunion, but I can tell you that you know, two days later, they, they, I don't think you'll be able to keep them away from the next one. And I think in terms of talking about the next reunion um, and future reunions, I think they'll go on forever. Um, as long as there's a core of people that are interested in uh, seeing this sort of thing continue, um, I don't see how it can stop. And I always find it exciting too when I attend these reunions to walk along and in a room of 150 to 200 people actually realise that I'm related to all of them. I think the information that we get together from these reunions is a, 
is a good tool, an educational tool, for all people to observe uh, things such as family unity and interesting cultural changes and backgrounds to families which make up the diverse community that Australia now is. I think we've got something here that's very unique to our family. I think we're all very proud to, to come here and see so many people attend a, a reunion that's so many miles away from home, uh, but you know, year after year we keep on coming back. To be able to think that we've got a family as, as vast as this one and you can just look amongst the crowd and think we're related somehow. It's something very special. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really good. Well, that I'm very glad to say they all try their best to carry on this reunion. And it just shows that they like to meet all the family and get together in memory of Dad. This continued unity in such a large and diverse family may seem unique in many ways. But a conscious effort was necessary to maintain contact, research the family history, to update records and conduct these regular and ongoing family reunions. Today the challenges remain to maintain the special bonds and sense of family in which individuals find support throughout their own life. Oh,